This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. The start of trading here for Japan and South Korea just a few moments away. But uh, Heidi, I think really the focus for us is is heading into the next hour because it's all about that RBNZ decision and are we going to be getting uh, some sort of surprise from them? Yeah, and as you mentioned earlier, so much of the focus is shifting back after the, you know, NVIDIA and tech frenzy back to uh, the bread and butter of central banks, right? Not just the RBNZ, we do have some outlier calls in terms of whether they might move, but also watching Fed speak, watching inflation out of Australia and uh, in the US, and of course some repricing around BOJ expectations as well. Yeah, that's right. We've really been forced to sort of recalibrate expectations for a number of different central banks. But here this morning, we've got to Japan just coming online here. The uh, Japanese yen there, you can see it unchanged at this point in time, but still at uh, that 150 mark, so a, a weak level. But uh, what else we're going to be tracking in the session is just that cautious tone that's going to be coming across from the Wall Street day, uh, given that, as you said, it is that countdown to those inflation metrics. We've got the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. We've got Australian inflation data that's also coming out. And trading volumes have been pretty thin, really, over the past few sessions as we await those numbers. Uh, we are taking a look at the Nikkei here. It is bang unchanged at this point in time. But, uh, of course, watching what's pretty close to a psychological level of 40,000 points there, you can see. Uh, let's uh, change on, take a look at what else we're tracking today. Korea markets, likewise, just opening here. And, again, you are seeing, yes, a little bit of positivity coming coming through, but it's very, very modest here as well. So not too much movement coming through in either direction. U.S. futures, you can see there, again, fairly steady. We didn't have big moves for the broader index overnight. It was really just those individual movers that came through. Some of the big tech, for instance, a bit of a change of fortunes there uh, for some of those names or a bit more moveset. Macy's as well, another, another mover in, in the prior session, Heidi. Yeah, take a look, Bell, at uh, how we're trading in Australia and New Zealand ahead of that RBNZ decision. Uh, stocks, uh, we're seeing Sydney stocks pretty uh, muted at this point, a little bit softer at this point, about two, uh, two tenths of one percent in the negative. The biggest laggards really seen across communication services. Some consumer names are struggling today, as well as financials, but some pretty robust gains still across tech, one point three percent, and a little bit of leadership from uh, miners and materials names there as well. The Aussie dollar is holding pretty steady. It's 65.44. We had some resilience when it comes to the US dollar. Uh, the dollar gauge erasing its decline. Traders are waiting that Thursday inflation data. Various Federal Reserve speakers are in focus as well. And uh, we are also just watching uh, what we're seeing across bond markets ahead of, of course, that key RBNZ decision. And we are seeing uh, when it comes to uh, some of the trading across Australian bonds falling before the CPI numbers. We're seeing Kiwi debt down a little bit before the RBNZ as well. Uh, but of course, when it comes to leadership from Treasuries, it is a big, big week when it comes to uh, corporate issuance as well as some sizable bond auctions as well. A quick check of oil. We're seeing some declines this morning. US stockpiles and the OPEC supply policy situation there very much in focus. But uh, focus for us at the moment is really that RBNZ decision in the coming hours. Uh, let's bring in our next guest who is bullish when it comes to, uh, in particular, the tech space within equities. Joining us now is Mike Bonduri, who's the CEO of SGMC Capital. Mike, it's great to have you with us. So obviously we had uh, a massive week last week with uh, the anticipation before NVIDIA and then just the big, you know, as you say, melt up <laughs> following those numbers. Do you think there's further to go? There are some concerns with the extraordinary gains that perhaps were at the peak, but do you think you should be adding to those positions? Well, we believe we're actually only at the beginning of a melt-up. We're not seeing the irrational phase yet where valuations get completely irrational. So we believe there's a lot more potential, meaningful upside for the Nasdaq. And there's actually three main reasons for that. If you look, first of all, at the ease with which the market has digested the new interest rate expectations, they went from pricing in seven to eight cuts of the Fed to about three cuts today, in line with what we've been saying actually last year. And the market has not corrected because of that. So that shows inner strength and solidity of the market. Then as you correctly pointed out, if you look at some of the blowout numbers from the semiconductor space and AI space like Nvidia, like Palantir, uh, you can see that if you know where to look, there's still huge growth and huge potential in some of the industries in the US space. 
And if you couple that with the fact that the growth overall in the U.S. remains solid and you're actually seeing a lot of potential new uh, infrastructure packages or basically new investments with respect to new capabilities within the tech space, within the semiconductor space, well, this makes us extremely bullish of the U.S. tech space going forward with, again, a non-insignificant chance of a further melt-up with Nasdaq potentially materially surprising to the upside from here. Does that mean you would be pretty constructive on some of the Asian markets that have heavy exposure to AI, to chip makers, Korea, Japan, Taiwan? Well, uh, definitely the whole space is going to be seeing potential move up, but there are some areas that we like more than others. For example, we do like Korea, um, we do like India, even though it's a little bit less exposed to the names and the sectors that I've just said. Uh, Japan, selectively, uh, we've been seeing, of course, a great run. We remain still over a little bit skeptical on Japan going forward, but in terms of names, if you look at the industry that I just mentioned, yes, the potential for a move up is there. And overall, we feel that the whole industry across the globe and Europe as well let's not forget that but the whole industry across the globe is likely to be uh, seeing more and more inflows for global investors which still have some cash available and who want to get in on the party that we've been seeing so far so if, if you're saying that you're seeing yes some gains for those tech heavy indexes Japan and, and, and Korea and Taiwan but really are you still more preferring than the US for, for this sort of melt-up scenario Correct. We remain overweight the U.S. from a geographical point of view. That's just because if you look at the kind of growth, if you look at the kind of developments, and in general they tend to be a little bit ahead of the competition when you're talking about these sectors, then U.S. remains our preferred um, geographical area, and we are overweight U.S., and we expect to remain overweight U.S. Um, for the foreseeable future. Max, we've actually just got some, some breaking news coming here that uh, Country Garden has uh, now facing a winding up petition here. So this is coming through from a creditor. It was filed, this petition, by Evercredit Limited at the High Court of the Hong Kong uh, SAR against the company. It's in relation to non-payment of a term loan facility between the petitioner as lender and the company as borrower. The principal amount here is relatively modest. It's 1.6, or rather, it's, well, it's perhaps not relatively modest, but it is 1.6 billion Hong Kong dollars plus accrued interest here. Uh, it is interesting because it comes roughly just one month after a Hong Kong court delivered a liquidation order to Evergrande. Uh, so it did sort of spark off one of the biggest casualties in, in the property crisis and, and quite, a, quite a significant process for them to be going down that track. But as I said, uh, Country Garden is, is now facing a winding up petition and that date for the first hearing of it is actually May of this year. So still a couple of months away. But when you hear these sorts of, of headlines, Max, it, it tells us that there's still perhaps a lot of pressure in the China property sector. It's still yet to be played out. Uh, even though we've seen that recent rally in Hong Kong stocks and, and, and mainland equities as well, do you really feel optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, again, we're talking about valuations which are cheap from a relative and absolute point of view. You've pointed out that we've had a rally in Hong Kong, but it was coming from extremely depressed levels. And talking about, you know, Country Garden, these kind of headlines expect them to keep coming over the coming months. Again, it's not going to be an extremely orderly uh, kind of development, especially within the real estate, which is one of the main industries with respect to China and Hong Kong, which has gone through incredible pressure uh, over the last years. And you can expect more of these headlines to come through but hopefully we're closer to the end than the beginning it's gonna get messy for sure it's gonna get even messier uh, but at the end of the day if uh, we get some kind of catalyst whereby you get more visibility with respect to the kind of policies they're going to be putting in place for business and for real estate going forward you could get a sustainable rally but once again until we see that until global investors can perceive that then you're not going to be seeing a rally which can be sustained uh, the rest of the year, it looks like geopolitics will just become more of a concern as we head into the November U.S. Uh, presidential election. Are you sort of positioning to try and either leverage or find some protection against those risks? 
Well, for the U.S. elections, it's still a few months away. Of course, we're going to keep hearing about it every single day from now till November. But the actual outcome is going to be only a few months away. So we're not overly worried about that. We're going to be looking more at from here to August and then looking to reduce before the actual election. In terms of geopolitics, geopolitics overall, yes, that is the main risk out there. Uh, there are unfortunately a number of uh, conflicts with respect to the um, throughout the globe. And those unfortunately need to be uh, continued uh, monitoring and you need to have a worst case scenario in place for your portfolios whether that is a hedge whether it is uh, being exposed only to liquid names which you can very easily and quickly get out of should something escalate meaningfully um, hopefully we all we all think and we all hope that no escalation is going to happen but yes you need to have some kind of uh, uh, a risk of uh, kind of switch if something does happen in order to protect your portfolios Max, always great to have you. That's Mike Von Dury, CEO at SGMC Capital. Oh, getting back to the RBNZ decision in the coming hours, most economists expect that New Zealand Central Bank will keep interest rates on hold in the next few hours while retaining that hawkish tone in inflation. Our Wellington Bureau Chief Matthew Brockett joins us now. And Matthew, let me just uh, throw up this chart that shows the, the sort of expectation, right? A hold is expected. There might still be a chance of a hawkish surprise, about 25% pricing uh, in that area. And we did see, of course, uh, the chance of more hikes for the RBNZ. They don't certainly see a cut until... November. What is the biggest argument, though, for staying on hold, even if they think more needs to be done down the track? Well, I think probably the biggest argument to stay on hold is that, um, you know, while some indicators have been firmer than expected, they're still moving in the right direction. The economy is cooling. Um, in fact, the statistics agency came out last year and revised downward previous uh, GDP outturns that showed the economy had been in a recession. And of course, you know, a lot of the tightening to date is still flowing through to the economy. So, you know, it would be a, a bold call to raise interest rates in that kind of environment. As Heidi alluded to, and, and you as well, Matthew, we, we did have a couple of economists, and we spoke to one of them in the last hour, A and Z, but we did have a couple of economists saying that we could see a hike today. Why is there that speculation? Yeah, well, this is the, the, the other argument. I mean, the, the RBNZ did warn late last year that it might need to raise interest rates again if inflation was stronger than expected, and arguably it has been. Um, at 4.7%, inflation in New Zealand is higher than in many of the countries we compare ourselves to. Um, the labour market is not cooling as quickly as expected. Record immigration is fueling demand and inflation expectations remain quite elevated. And you also have to look at the recent comments from policymakers, um, which have sounded quite hawkish. So, I mean, there certainly are uh, arguments there to be made for a rate hike today. The other thing, of course, will be in the forecasts, right? What are you keeping an eye out for in particular and what are you expecting to see? Well, I think the, the key there is the, the forward track for the cash rate. Um, the previous track implied the risk of a hike. We'll be look, waiting to see whether they push that, that risk a little higher, maybe imply an even greater risk of a, of, of a hike. Or, as you say, they could potentially push out any future rate cuts, perhaps you know, towards the end of uh, 2025, to sort of send a message of high for longer on interest rates. That was our Wellington Bureau Chief, Matthew Brockwood, as we count down to that decision. It's due at the top of the next hour. And you can also turn to your Bloomberg for more on the RBNZ decision. We're going to have a team of, of analysts, of, of expert commentary as well, coming through on this decision. So go to T-Life Go to get more on that, uh, that blog kicking off shortly. Still ahead, Still ahead, though, the US Treasury Secretary calling on the world's biggest economies to unlock frozen Russian assets to help Ukraine in its war. We get more from the G20 gathering in Sao Paulo later this hour. But first, Apple is said to be cancelling a decade-long effort to build its, own, build its own EV. We get more from our market-moving scoop next. This is Bloomberg.
All right, we're about 15 minutes so far into the session for trading in Tokyo, and there's a couple of different movers we're keeping an eye on today. One of those is Rakuten here. Uh, we are watching that e-commerce company, uh, given it's planning to issue up to 100 billion yen. That's about 666 million U.S. dollars of corporate bond-type shares. So it's all about trying to strengthen its financial position. Uh, they're planning to sell as much as 75 million of the stocks. They're not going to have any voting rights, and they also can't be converted into common shares. Share. So it's all as well about trying to uh, avoid any dilution. But uh, Rakuten, one of the names we're watching, as we said, planning to sell up to 666 million US dollars of bond type shares. Sony also in the headlines today because it's cutting some jobs. So 900 positions are going from its gaming division worldwide. And that's actually about 8% of its employees and they're also going to be closing a group in London. So uh, Sony is saying that they've made this decision after many leadership discussions over several months, but uh, they're saying that changes are needed now for, for the company in order for it to continue growing. Toyota we're watching and also some of its uh, affiliates here because we do have uh, essentially Toyota restarting its Japan plant lines. Uh, they were suspended earlier uh, given there were some issues with uh, engines that were being manufactured by the company or one of its uh, affiliates, as I said. So essentially, we're watching Toyota there. You can see a little bit under pressure, Heidi. Some of the other corporate stories, Bell, that we're watching this hour and Bloomberg sources say Alibaba has led the largest single financing round for a Chinese AI startup. We're told it joined Monolith Management in a billion dollar funding round for Moonshot AI, boosting the firm's valuation eightfold to some two and a half billion dollars. Moonshot is among the better known startups developing generative AI in China, hoping to rival the likes of OpenAI and Google. Chinese chipmaker Fujian Jinhua Integrated Circuit has been cleared of economic espionage and other criminal charges by a U.S. judge. The verdict comes more than five years after the firm was blacklisted as a threat to national security. Prosecutors had alleged that Fujian Jinhua stole secrets from Micron Bell. Yeah, and Heidi, one of the big stories we've been tracking over the last few hours is actually a Bloomberg scoop because we had this big story coming out on Apple and and, it, and it's been really a program with a lot of twists and turns and, and maybe that applies to different divisions at Apple but certainly the one we're talking about today is the electric vehicle decision because just a month ago we were saying that Apple's plans for an electric vehicle had been pushed out that also scaled back their ambitions in this sector and now we understand actually... They're going to be completely cancelling this. And, and as we were speaking with, with Tom Giles in the last hour, I mean, this is something that they put billions of dollars into and thousands of resources or, or personnel and, and a, a more than decade-long effort all about trying to build an electric car. This is according to sources, but we did have a Bloomberg scoop on this, so we, we got some disclosures that were made internally, but certainly a surprise to, to more than 2,000 employees working on that project, it seems, Heidi. Right, and it comes, Bill, of course, as we've been talking about, it's been difficult for a lot of the players within this space, right, even some of the competitors uh, that have really been, you know, trudging through the research and development and uh, trying to get a piece of this market. We had that, you know, uh, pretty, I guess you can say, smug response from Elon Musk uh, on Twitter <laughs> and on X, I should say, just responding to our reporting. But as you say, in terms of who this impacts, nearly 2,000 employees working on the project, um, and it was a decision that was shared by the chief operating officer as well as the VP in charge of the effort according to our reporting. In terms of the reaction of course you know in the long run Bloomberg Intelligence says that the shunning of the EV project shifting to AI is a better strategy for Apple in the long run given its expertise really is more on small devices very very different to building a car right but Bloomberg Intelligence saying that decision uh, really shifts resources towards generative AI it's a good strategic move given the long term and profitability potential of AI revenue streams versus cars, they anticipate that a large portion of generative AI enhancements will be part of the Apple operating system. Uh, and obviously, Apple then has one of the strongest consumer distribution networks globally. So if they can bring those two together, a uh, hugely, hugely lucrative operation uh, and opportunities there. But we understand that this project will begin winding down. The car team employees, which is known as a special projects group or SPG, will be shifted actually to the AI 
higher division. Uh, and they'll be focusing on what is really becoming a key, a key priority for the company. So investors clearly seeing that as a relief. We saw the stock up about 1% by the close. It's still trading a little bit higher in after hours. Yeah. Uh, and that story is uh, one of our top stories, Bell, but also you can get a roundup of the other stories you want to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Bloomberg subscribers can get that at Debut Go on the terminals. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customise those settings as well for the news in the industries and assets you care about. This is Bloomberg. After the G20's closing statement that was seen by Bloomberg News says the global economy has a growing chance of pulling off a soft landing. The group's finance ministers are meeting in Brazil against the backdrop of wars in Ukraine and Gaza. And Bloomberg's Bruce Einhorn joins us for more. And Bruce, yeah, I mean, as we we're just saying there in the ad break, it seems like things are looking up a little bit. Yeah, so this is a draft statement, so still things could be changed. But um, from you know, what our colleagues at Bloomberg have seen, uh, the, the statement will talk about how there is a greater likelihood of a soft landing for the global economy, uh, underpinned to a large extent by the U.S. Uh, Janet Yellen, who's uh, there in Brazil for these meetings, uh, took a bit of a victory lap. She said that a press conference, she said that America's path to a soft landing has underpinned global growth. Bruce, uh, what was uh, some of the remarks being made when it comes to Russia's immobilized assets? Uh, so uh, Janet Yellen in that um, in that same press conference also did talk about that. So um, some background here is there are about two hundred and eighty billion dollars of Russian assets that have been frozen. Um, about two thirds of those are in uh, Europe. Uh, the question is what to do with them, especially given the the dire straits that Ukraine is now facing, um, with Russia now making some advances in the war, um, with aid to Ukraine really tied up in Congress um, and unclear whether that's really going to get through from the U.S. Uh, so there are there are proposals out there to do something with that $280 billion of assets. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K. have advocated just seizing it. Um, there are other possible ways because uh, there are others like the, the Germany and France are opposed to the idea of seizing it because seizing it because of the precedent that could set elsewhere. Uh, uh, Janet Yellen talked about other ways that that money could go to use, say it could be used as collateral for uh, getting funding for Ukraine. Uh, so it's just an idea out there, uh, unclear whether there's just going to be any further progress on this um, but uh, uh, Ukraine needs the money. And, and to that end, I mean, we, we've sort of seen Zelensky being quite mobile and, and, and talking with a lot of different world leaders of late, and, and that includes making a second trip to Saudi Arabia where he met with the, the Crown Prince there. What, what was the outcome of those negotiations and, and how, how did he come to go to Saudi Arabia in particular, do you uh, think? A good question, because Saudi Arabia is one of the um, the few countries that has hosted Vladimir Putin since the since this full-scale invasion started two years ago, uh, China, of course, being another one. Mm. Uh, so uh, Saudi Arabia could play an important role in any sort of uh, diplomatic effort to to end this war. Uh, President Zelensky, as you said, this is the second trip to, to Saudi Arabia this year. Uh, he has been talking up a blueprint for a peace proposal. Um, that's clearly something that he'd like the Saudis to get on board with. It's really unclear just how much progress they made on that. There was there, no sign that there's any agreement there. Um, it is something that he's going to keep on advocating. Uh, whether Vladimir Putin and the Russian government is willing to go along with that, it's a yeah. big question. <laughs> Bloomberg Spirit Sign Horn there. Uh, much more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. We do 
just have breaking numbers when it comes to consumer inflation. Uh, the January reading for Australia coming in at 3.4 per cent. That is actually a little bit softer when it comes to uh, expectations that were sitting at around 3.6 per cent, but still staying elevated from the previous month's reading <laughs> of 3.4 per cent. And there were some uh, really some concerns when it comes to uh, the mismatch potentially between what we've been hearing from the RBA and what has been very uh, aggressive positioning for rate cuts. This surge that we've seen in Australian bonds in particular, perhaps setting up some uh, of that relief as well. Uh, we are seeing Aussie 10 years sitting at about 12 basis points under uh, Treasuries at the moment. But perhaps a little bit of a relief when it comes to expectations that we continue to see that heat coming through from Australian inflation readings. Uh, and they come that reading actually at 3.4 per cent, a little bit softer than expectations. And uh, in fact, that broad slowdown kind of starting to uh, stretch out potentially a little bit. There are concerns, though, from economists, including here at Bloomberg Economics, that uh, CPI potentially could cool even further over the rest of the, f uh, the first quarter, but that we do still have those lingering upside pressures from uh, rental costs, insurance, uh, household utilities, uh, amongst other factors that could keep inflation more to the upside. So the March 19 to uh, 18 to 19, I should say, bill is the next RBA meeting, so that will be uh, heavily deliberated along with the next fourth quarter GDP numbers as well due out. Yeah, Heidi, Aussie dollar, not too much changed off that. But let's shift now to some breaking news that we had at the top of the hour because this was the distressed Chinese developer Country Garden. It's received a winding up petition in Hong Kong. It defaulted on a dollar bond back in October and it overtook rival Evergrande as the epicentre of China's property crisis. So let's get more from our bond and loan reporter Loretta Chen joining us. And Loretta, just give us the headline details here who filed this petition. What exactly are they hoping to achieve as well? Yeah, so from the following, we think it's a single creditor named Evercredit, and it's actually a unit of a Hong Kong listed company called Kingboard. Uh, so they had a loan agreement between Country Garden and this company of Hong Kong dollar, uh, 1.6 billion Hong Kong dollars. So it's not a big amount, and Country Garden actually emphasized in its statement that it doesn't represent the broader interests of its other creditors. So on the surface, it does seem like a dispute between two companies rather than some broader. Uh, creditor uh, dispute. How does this play into the broader restructuring process? Yeah, so Country Garden is in discussion with this other creditor. So I think that um, winding up petition really comes at this um, unfortunate time when it, when in the case of Evergrande, we actually see that eventually the creditors are siding with these petitioners of winding up petition because they're so disappointed by the talks they have, uh, by the by the failure of that restructuring going on. So, so the same risk could apply for Country Garden. Um, so we need to see more. Uh, that comes out between Country Garden and other creditors, maybe there will be some progress on the restructuring and maybe there will also, on the other hand, be some private settlement between this single creditor and the company. Um, and uh, so, so far we are not sure. And there's a hearing in Hong Kong scheduled in May, so in three months' time. So I'm going to be tracking quite closely and as you're saying, you've got to really dig into the details more over the course of the today. But that was our bond and loan reporter there, Loretta Chen, joining us. Thanks for your time. And uh, sticking in Hong Kong, but shifting slightly here because the city is expected to ease curbs on property transactions when its annual budget is unveiled later on Wednesday. The city's real estate industry, along with many local politicians, have been pressuring the government to help lift a lackluster market out of its worst slump in more than two decades. Joining us now is Rosanna Tang, head of Hong Kong research at Cushman and Wakefield. And Rosanna, yeah, as, as we know, the, the, the expectation is that we're going to have all property cooling stamp duties scrapped. Realistically, is that going to sort of shift the needle here at all for the sector? Well, I think if you look back, um, actually the government has already announced uh, a, 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 an easing policy in the uh, policy address last year in October. And we did see that in terms of the transaction volume, it did help to slightly pick up um, the residential S&P volume from a very low level last year in December and January this year. However, it didn't really pick up the price per se. So I think for this time, even though if they can, well, 
completely ease all the cooling measures. It may help to restore certain market confidence and buyer sentiment, but it won't really trigger a V-shaped rebound immediately and boost the housing price. Yeah, so just on that house price, would you have any sort of estimates on, on the sort of gains that we could see? Well, I think currently the uh, residential market overall is being impacted by a couple of different external factors. Mm -hmm. So apart from the cooling measures that has been hinging on the market, we also see that interest rate hike as well as the economic recovery pace, as well as the recent stock market volatility. All these factors are also impacting certain buyer sentiment. Um, and and hence, we do believe that it, in order for the market to restore its stability, we do need all these factors to getting sort of getting in place. So um, apart from the policy itself, um, we do think that interest rate hike would also be a very important factor, whether the Fed would um, see the peak in terms of the rate hike in the later half of this year, or even for the rates to um, slightly come down a little bit, would definitely um, help on restoring the market price. Yeah, so when it comes to restoring the market price, because as, as you say, a few different factors here, what do you think is really going to have the biggest bearing on, on the outcome here? Is it going to be government policies? Is it going to be some sort of pickup in China's mainland China's economy? Or is it going to be the Fed that starts to cut rates in the H? KMA can follow suit as well? Well, I think the biggest impact would definitely be the interest rate impact um, because we do see that currently in the buying segment in the residential market, one of the big group would be the potential pent-up demand from the end users. And these buyers, they are actually waiting on the sideline because they are afraid that the market hasn't touched the bottom yet and they are waiting until they can see a clearer picture whether the, the interest rate is going to peak or is going to come down this year before the actually going to purchase into the market because this group of potential buyers is sensitive to interest rate. And the other types of buyer that we've seen is perhaps uh, those who already have certain um, um, home already in Hong Kong but purchase residential apartment for their investment. And these buyers currently, they park their money in banks because of the higher interest rate that the banks can offer. So if the interest rate can come down, they may as well review um, uh, the residential apartments in Hong Kong as a viable tool for their investment again and then they will get back to the market. Do you see a better outlook when it comes to uh, retail and commercial? Uh, for the commercial sector, uh, retail, as you said, I think that this will also be one of the key focus of the government budget uh, today because um, I think currently they are really keen to attract or, or expand the tourism base um, to attract different um, tourists back to Hong Kong. And um, at the same time, I think um, for the uh, retail uh, sentiment here, um, what's the key current challenges is that um, apart from attracting different travelers back in town, we also see that the local spending happens has been changing. We do see that some of the local residents, they are willing to spend their weekend uh, across the board to uh, uh, Shenzhen or nearby Greater Bay Area cities, which also can uh, erode certain local purchasing power in town. So I think the government would really want to boost uh, the retail sentiment this time. Do you think that when it comes to retail, particularly when it comes to high-end luxury and the impact that we've seen over the past couple of years as a result of COVID policies and the China slowdown, do you think that sort of restructuring and the exit of a lot of these brands is permanent? And how does that, I guess, play into what the retail side of, of commercial real estate potentially looks like? Well, I think currently, um, as far as we talk to our clients and our uh, retail leasing team, um, most of the international brands, luxury brands, they currently uh, prefer to stay put and um, observe the market for a, 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 at least a couple of more months. Because, as we mentioned earlier, because of the changing spending habit of the tourists, as well as for the local spending power, um, so um, they may be eager to see that uh, uh, after some of the government 
government policy of this kind of boosting the retail sentiment or uh, to trigger more mega events in Hong Kong, how actually the uh, tourists will react in town? Because currently, some of these tourists, they are not necessarily only eyeing on shopping in Hong Kong anymore. Some of them are actually uh, leaning towards to have a more experiential um, retail uh, experience in Hong Kong. So um, they are, some of the retailers are waiting to see um, how these uh, changing behaviors would be before they really uh, re-strategize their uh, expansion plans in Hong Kong at the moment. We've seen a lot of pressure on office occupancy globally, mm -hmm. but Hong Kong perhaps is a little bit in a worse position to, in some ways than, than other places, given there is a lot of supply coming mm -hmm. onto the market. We haven't had a lot of mainland businesses. They've sort of been retreating from the city. Mm -hmm. Other Western businesses have been leaving as well. What's the outlook here? Well, I think... Um our well, in terms of the new demand, it actually aligns with some of the other oh, what, what we've seen in the other global cities. Work from home would definitely have certain impact in town, but at the same time, I think the market is also seeing that, as you mentioned, um, perhaps the um, opening of border last year didn't really trigger as much of new demand as the market has expected before. So um, currently, the challenges is really um, the, the upcoming. Uh, new supply pipeline added on the um, already high av availability. So, um, in a way, it may be good for some of the occupiers um, in terms of the flight to quality move, in terms of those corporates seeking for high quality buildings with ESG mandates. Um, then we do see some kind of these relocations happening in town. Um, but at the same time, I think from a landlord's perspective, perhaps more of them would be um, more flexible in providing capex, in providing different incentives to really secure their existing occupants um, in their buildings uh, to keep up their occupancy rates. Rosanna Tang, head of Hong Kong research at Cushman and Wakefield. Great to have you with us. You can also turn to your Bloomberg for more on this. TLI Vigo is a commentary and analysis from our team of expert editors. And you can get an insider's guide to the money and the people shaking up the Finance Hub in our new Hong Kong edition newsletter. Out every Thursday, you can sign up via Bloomberg.com slash newsletters. All to come here on Daybreak Asia, this is Bloomberg. And so I look at where the best investors in the world are today, and they are places where the decision making and the investment are very closely tied together. And I look at places like Singapore and I look at places like the Emirates um, who are doing unbelievable things. Apollo Global Management CEO Mark Rowan there on where he thinks the best investors are. Take a look at the state of trading this midweek session. It has been pretty muted, to be honest, as we continue to uh, sort of wait for a bunch of Fed speak. And of course, the RBNZ decision is on the slate today as well in the coming hours, with still that um, slight chance that we could potentially see a bit of a surprise move there. Uh, so, a pretty quiet session, if you will. The Nikkei 225 is actually pretty flat at the moment. We're looking at that 40,000 level, but we're a fair ways away from that next milestone yet despite some pretty steady positive trading in that market. The cost B South Korean stocks up by three tenths of one percent there. We're seeing a muted session here in Australia. We did get uh, Joe's uh, CPI numbers out just before pairing those losses uh, when it comes to the equity side after we had the inflation remained kind of surprisingly steady in January and that potentially adds more evidence for the case for the RBA to begin cutting rates later on this year. We're seeing a bit of downside there for the ASX. Kiwi we stocks very much cautious as we get into that RBNZ decision. And looking also to uh, some of the, uh, the, the the potential sort of forecasting changes as well. Uh, but what we are also seeing quite a bit of activity in terms of that potential for fireworks from the RBNZ is really if you take a look at Kiwi implied volatility. We're sitting at uh, around a seven month high now. The bulk of that move did happen yesterday though we're seeing this tick up even further uh, just ahead 
ahead of that RBNZ decision. So we're bringing you the details and of course that reaction when it comes to uh, the trading in the Kiwi dollar. Uh, the Aussie Kiwi certainly continuing at an advance when it comes to that pair ahead of the RBNZ with uh, the dollar still a little bit stronger compared to its, uh, uh, it, it, it's, its Kiwi peer, I should say. Bill. <laughs> Well, Heidi, of course, that decision is due in uh, just under 15 minutes from now, so we're going to be tracking that. And as you said, we do have that blog running if you go to TLive. But what else we're going to be tracking at the top of the next hour is shares of OCBC uh, because we've got trading that kicks off in Singapore, and that's after the bank reported fourth quarter net income that missed the average analyst estimate. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst Sarah Jane Mahmood in Singapore. And Sarah, yeah, miss at, at the top line level but still you're you're picking up on the brighter spots so we had as well yes that's right so a low OCBC did miss consensus forecast in the fourth quarter and for 2023 on profit it did report overall very positive results with good performance across the business now the the consensus miss was chiefly due to weaker than expected non-interest income contributions where the weaker contribution from its insurance subsidiary Great Eastern in the fourth quarter. Its total income actually reached a record high in 2023 on strong margin expansion off the back of the Fed rate hikes and also favourable shifts in its asset mix. And I think this is reflected in its higher dividend payment, which represents now 53% payout ratio. What are the expectations for 2024? I think 2024 is going to be somewhat of a, a mixed bag. Uh, OCBC can certainly expect some tailwinds from growth in wealth assets under management in 2023 and capitalise on its strategic expansion plans in ASEAN and also in Greater China. So we do expect an uptick in fee income this year. Um, loan growth is likely to remain relatively weak, especially in Singapore. And then we've also got to factor in margin compression in the first half with rising costs of funds and also expect for the Fed to start cutting rates in the second half. What about the outlook for M&A? Because we've seen OCBC maybe coming a little bit under the radar here, but still somewhat active. Yes, that's right. Um, OCBC has been very active in M&A, perhaps with less high-profile acquisitions than its peers, DBS and UIB, after they acquired the retail units of a city group in various regions in, uh, in Asia-Pacific. Um, so OCBC is in the process of acquiring, acquiring the Indonesian unit of Commonwealth Bank of Australia, and there's such high growth potential in Indonesia. It's quite an exciting opportunity. And also and MetLife over in Malaysia. It's also, I think, important to note that OCBC maintains a stronger capital buffer than its peers. So it is armed with you know, the, the right money to invest, to engage in further M&A when the right opportunity does arise and to grow organically and inorganically over the mid to long term. That was Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for Southeast Asian Bank, Sarah Jane Mahmood in Singapore there. And as we said, Singapore trade opening at the top of the next hour. But let's uh, take a look at some other corporate stories we're tracking today. eBay shares jumped in late trade with a strong holiday quarter, giving investors fresh hope following steep job cuts. Fourth quarter profit was $1.07 a share on sales of $2.56 billion, both of those actually beating the average analyst estimate. eBay also added $2 billion to an existing stock buyback program. Shares of dating app Bumble tumbled after the bell after its revenue forecast for the current quarter of up to $268 million fell short of estimates. It's also cutting about one third of its workforce or about 350 roles globally as it seeks to revive slowing user growth. Bumble says the cuts will help centralise engineering and product teams in fewer locations. We'll have more ahead on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg.
The CEO of Gold and Copper producer Newmont says the company is positioned for a once-in-a-generation stock gain. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, Tom Palmer told us that plans for a billion-dollar buyback are on track following the acquisition of Australia's Newcrest. Our stock is at a once-in-a-generational price. Last week was a big week for Newmont. We announced, following our big acquisition of Newcrest, a go-forward portfolio that's never been seen before in the gold industry. It's all tier one operations. It's got great exposure to copper. It's got some great projects sitting in behind it. If you come into new month stock now and ride the value with us, back us, you are, you are going to go for a, a journey with us that will significantly increase <laughs> that stock from where it is today. Tom, I'm laughing because that was a CEO answer if I've ever heard one. Um, on the flip side, though, you're looking at uh, cutting the quarterly dividend when you reported, and you had to reset your dividend policy in part because you're absorbing Newcrest, and you have to sell a lot of assets to kind of make this acquisition uh, happen, and you have to deal with synergies and stuff. Part of that is $2 billion in cash sale of assets. How's that going? All going to plan, Alex. It's what we announced back in, in May of last year when we announced the deal. We said there'd be synergies. We said there'd be $2 billion of cash from portfolio optimization. We expected to adjust our capital allocation to match the transformed business. We'll get our balance sheet nice and fit. We'll pay a $1 a share based dividend. We'll get $2 billion of proceeds at least coming in from those divestments. Uh, and, and a good portion of that money will go towards our $1 billion share buyback. Everything consistent with what we announced in May of last year. How soon do you think those divestments will come, Tom? And once they are done, where does that put Newmont next? We committed to work through six uh, assets that we held for divestment. We worked through those for the course of the next 12 months. Process has started with two of them. There's a bunch in North America that will start in the next months or so. So we're on track, got clear plans to, uh, to have that work through over the course of this year. Uh, our focus is on delivering the value and the synergies from our go forward tier one portfolio. That's our focus for 2024. Get beyond that. We've got some very big copper gold projects sitting in the wings waiting to uh, increase our exposure to copper in 25, 26 yeah. and beyond. Really exciting time. That was the Newmont CEO, Tom Palmer, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg there. And let's get a look at the, some of the stocks we're going to be watching when markets open in Hong Kong and mainland China at the bottom of the next hour. Uh, first up is distressed Chinese developer Country Garden. It's received a winding up petition in Hong Kong. The first hearing date for that petition is scheduled after May 17. We're also going to be watching the moves in other developers in the city after local media reported that Financial Secretary Paul Chan may announce the easing of some property curves. New World Development, Sang Hung Kai Properties and Henderson Land Development are among the stocks on our radar. And Heidi, not just those names, you're also taking a look at Baidu and the expectations around earnings there. Yeah, Baidu is a big one uh, that we're watching for in terms of uh, really wanting to see evidence of then seizing the AI advantages to try and uh, erase that 30% drop uh, and the luck cluster sales growth really going to be progress when it comes to the AI progress. But of course, we are headed into in the next five minutes the RBNZ policy decision. You can follow along at our TLIV blog. This is Bloomberg.